Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to LSU Science Cafe. I'm Steve Beck with the LSU Office of Research and Economic Development, and we're excited to bring you tonight's program featuring nanoscience engineer, Dr. Theda Daniels Race and legal scholar, Professor Paul Race, joining us from Southern University Law Center, who will be speaking on the science and ethics of the super small. Live closed captioning for this event is available. Click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Despite our physical distance, our goal is to continue to build a strong and informed community by providing access to reliable information, new ideas and cutting edge research, scholarship and creativity from faculty experts and researchers in fields across the university. Tonight's event is brought to you in partnership with local public radio station WRKF. Check out the first season of WRKF's new climate change podcast called Life Raft, available for download wherever you get your podcasts. WRKF will be giving away one stainless steel NPR Science Friday, uh, Science Friday beverage tumbler to one lucky audience member tonight. To enter the WRKF drawing, click on the link in the chat box and fill out the Google form with your contact information. Also, please be aware that this online event is being recorded. It will be available with a transcription from the LSU Research website within the next few days. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. speakers. Dr. Theda Daniels-Race is the Michael Voorhees Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering with a joint appointment to the LSU Center for Computation and Technology. Her expertise is in the area of nanoelectronics, particularly with respect to nanomaterials and quantum electronics. Dr. Paul A. Race has degrees in both law and medicine, and he is an associate professor of law with the Southern University Law Center. His expertise is in health law and constitutional law, both of which are challenged to respond to rapidly emerging new technologies like nanotechnologies. After the presentation, we'll have a moderated question and answer session. To participate, please use the Q&A button to enter your question. We will be monitoring that section and relaying them to our panelists. Now, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Theda Daniels Race. Theda, Welcome to Science Cafe. Theta, your mic is, is off. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I think we've got it now. I was just saying thank you so much, Dr. Beck, um, and to you and your staff and the Science Cafe for having me this evening. And um, as you all can see by this title, um, Nanotechnology, Reality versus Nanobots, Gray Goo and Other Strange Stuff. Uh, suffice it to say, if you've looked at anything regarding nano, which these days is even on kids' cartoons, um, you've probably, and if you're a sci-fi buff like me, then you probably run into some of these um, sort of ideas of what's going to happen with this type of technology, which quite honestly has been around even for, for decades. But, Nonetheless, let's uh, get into it. So I'll ask for the next slide, please. Okay, so not to offend anyone's intelligence, but I believe in starting at the beginning. And so as we talk about nanometers, I thought if you came up through school like I did, like you know most typical Americans, we had inches and feet and yards, okay? So this is just to show you that a meter is just a little bit bigger than, than a yard. So if you have a yardstick and you were to think about how long is a meter, there you go, uh, 39.37 inches. So to think about nanometers, right? And, and again, maybe going back to your old you know, high school or these days, probably for kids, elementary school math, we're talking about one times 10 to the minus nine. So next slide, please. So this slide, what's a nanometer? Um, I used to tell people, think of a meter stick and then divide it into a billion equal pieces. But it's kind of hard to get your head around, you know, what's a billionth of a meter, right? Without sort of a, a visual, at least it is for me. So I found this and I thought it, it was quite appropriate in showing that one times to the minus nine meters 
is a billionth of a meter, that's a nanometer. And it's the thickness, well, a sheet of paper is about 100,000 times thicker than a nanometer. So I guess the idea is the way I put it is if you take a sheet of paper and this being, if I can get in the camera there, right? And so this being, you know, one sheet or two sheets. And if I split this right into two sheets and I kept doing that a billion times, <laughs> then you would have a nanometer. Um, likewise, if you're looking at it atomically, for example, a gold atom, as it says, there's about a third of a nanometer in diameter. So hopefully that gives you some sense um, of, of the size that we're talking about. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there we are. This uh, particular slide has been out for some years. Actually, the Department of Energy uh, put it out some years ago. And it was just to give you, you can Google the words, the scale of things and, and pull this right up. And so for example, take a look at the ant, you know, on the top left there. And ant is about five millimeters. So, you know, again, if you're not even into millimeters, think about an ant. For Louisiana, we can probably think of another bug, but I'll just leave it at ant, okay? And so if you look at the scale in the middle there where you see 100,000 nanometers equal one millimeter, where, well, an ant, right, is about five, you know, well, one, yes, is, is even that much larger, right, than a nanometer. Let me just keep going here. Red blood cells. Um, now, I'm not on the bio side of things. You'll have to ask my uh, colleague and spouse about that. But red blood cells, you see at seven to eight, and that symbol there represents microns, or 10 to the minus six. So when I was coming through graduate school and such, we talked about microelectronics. And if you look on the scale there, if you're talking about a mic micrometer, you're talking about a thousand nanometers, right? And then on up to about a hundred microns is what we call the world of microelectronics. So integrated circuits, chips, all that sort of thing that, you know, if you've been involved in electronics, you've probably heard about, you know, uh, in the 70s with Jack Kilby and going forward into the 80s and so forth. Well, now in this nano world, right, if we look there, oh, I'd say on the bottom right, uh, to the right there, carbon nanotubes, if you've heard of buckyballs, um, you're talking about a nanometer there, that's uh, 60, 60 carbon atoms arranged in a, a configuration, looks like a soccer ball. Um, likewise, uh, any number of things on this chart. But the bottom line is to tell you, yes, we're dealing with things, oh, there's part of the bane of my existence, pollen, uh, <laughs> there on the right-hand side uh, below the head of a pin. So it just sort of gives you a sense of where we're talking in this world of nano, but basically anything 100 nanometers or less, and you can see visually going into the UV and so forth, that's the nanometer world. But what does that really mean for us in today's world besides electronics. So next slide, please. As I mentioned a moment ago, if you've run into any science fiction or any fun movies, you've probably seen something like this. We're, we're gonna get our faces eaten by these nanomites, right? So this is a, about a two minute clip. It's from the movie G.I. Joe that came out a few years ago. So you get the picture, um, at least as has been uh, given to us in a lot of uh, popular media. Anything from these little tiny robots are going to uh, destroy materials, um, attack people. Um, <laughs> so as I put here, sort of the myths, myths of nanotechnology, right? Uh, just a bunch of tiny robots, but they're bad, right? Um, some have said it's too futuristic. It's going, it's not even practical. Well, I will say if you've ever purchased a, a jacket, there's a company called Gore-Tex, G-O-R-T-E-X, and it's nice and warm. There's actually, um, I, it's probably proprietary, but they have some sort of nanoparticles in the fabric, in the textile. In fact, the textile industry has been using nanoparticles for some time for things like um, antiviral activity, uh, warmth of the jacket and so forth. So too futuristic, you probably already have worn it. Cost prohibitive, if that were the case then my students wouldn't be graduating because we've had several students come to the lab and through my uh, group with regard to working in the uh, field of nanomaterials, nanoelectronics. Some say it's just trendy. Well, I think that trend's here to stay because uh, people seem to like their phones that are not the size of the brick phone uh, if anybody remembers back that their parents had a long time ago and now you know we've got you know well mine's kind of big so i can see it and use it but there are tiny phones and then some would say it's just too complex well of course you know we have science cafe so we it's not too complex that's part of tonight is its general consumption uh so next slide please 
And I believe this is my last slide. So as I was saying, uh, all of this nano work, uh, net to ask someone really to talk about nanotechnology is like saying, please lecture about the universe uh, <laughs> and do it in 10 minutes, right? Because it is really an area that takes into account certainly EE electrical engineering, but physics, chemistry, biology, material science, mechanical engineering, and forgive me if I've left out some. But these are my students who, as you can tell, I'm very proud of them. We are the Applied Hybrid Electronic Materials and Structures Laboratory, or AHEMS. Um, as you can see, it's a very diverse group. So we like to call it by my last name, the race group. And all of these folks on the left are gainfully employed with their having gotten their master's and or PhD. And one even went on to get his MBA, late, MBA later. And on the right side there, um, we have some of the um, young men that are still in my group, the young woman I'm very proud of. LSU undergrad, that book she's holding is a first prize at a conference we attended, where as an undergraduate, she beat out grad students, postdocs, and even some faculty in a poster presentation of the work that we'd done and that she uh, worked as an independent uh, study student in my lab. So nano is real, here are the real people. And with that, I will say thank you. Hopefully didn't go over 10 minutes and turn you over to my dear colleague and, and best friend and spouse, uh, Dr. Paul Anthony Race Esquire. <laughs> All right. uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting me. When my wife came to me and said, do you want to, um, I understood like most husbands that that was not do you want to, it was really more honey you're going to do. <laughs> and that's why I'm here today, guys. Uh, I will tell you up front, I am not a patent lawyer. As he said, I actually do constitutional law. I'm a health lawyer. I'm a retired physician. I used to deliver babies uh, before I went back to law school. Um, and so great to be here. The primary thing I'm gonna tell you about the law is a fundamental issue is that the law lags behind technology. So we will have technological advancement and then the law starts to get involved. The first thing that has to get involved with, how are we going to protect the people who do it? And should it be protected? Uh, the, as she said, nanotechnology has been around for a while. The IBM first started getting patents really back around late 70s, late to mid 70s. So we've had it for a while. We just, as most things, it start off slow and then we get to an explosion. And then comes the question of what do you protect? Are you protecting the devices? Are you, are you protecting the, with patents the, or copyright, the process by which these things are discovered? Because remember, uh, after, before the device, you have to discover the properties and are the properties that are being discovered something that should be protected? By the way, this also came up when we did DNA, for example, when they did the, D, the genome project. If someone defines a gene, do they get to profit from anybody who manipulates that gene or finds stuff to go after, you know, to affect that gene? And that becomes an issue under the law let alone the fact that there are things that come up after these treatment modalities or things that are invented. Um, I'll give an example. There was a condition called Huntington's chorea. Uh, and a number of years ago, they were able to figure out a test to test for Huntington's chorea. And here's the thing, if, you, if the parent has this condition, there's a one in two chance that the child would have it. And so what they would do, insurance companies were requiring children to determine if they had it. And then if they had it, then they were either going to have to pay a large amount of the insurance or not be covered at all. Uh, well, we passed a law many years ago that basically said insurance companies could not do that. This is sort of a response to a technology that was developed. And then when we get to nanotechnology, not only do we have the protection side of it, uh, you would say that for every five great things that come from a technology, there may be one thing that can be negative about it. And then comes the question of what do we do about it? With the advent of nanotechnology, basically we're able to accumulate a tremendous amount of information in a shorter period of time and in a, in a smaller piece of, uh, on a smaller piece of data. We also have the ability to go in and affect DNA, for example. So these are all things that play a role when we are thinking about nanotechnology. We also have the fact that uh, as we go through this, 
are there things that we want to protect from all this information that's being gathered and that I, I was at a conference um, actually just about a week and a half ago. And when they talked about that with the amount of data out there, you could have two people use a online service or call a service to get a plane ticket. And because of the private data that they have on you, they would charge two different prices, even though you both uh, go into the same site and you can even do it at the same time. Well, do we want that? And do we want the law to step in and protect that? So um, these are all the factors that come in, let alone we get into the factors of what about other consequences that can happen. One of the things our body is, our body is designed to protect against pathogens and things that come into our body. Well, as we start doing things on a nano scale, right, and we create devices, we are creating those to specifically put in the, in the body. But as we start creating it, how much do we have to worry about it getting into the environment, you know, and what that can do and what are the consequences? I mean, how do much do we protect it? You know, and plus the fact, what do we need to do in terms of people getting approval to do things? I mean, truthfully, the FDI, all, nano, all nano devices with medicine are going to go through the FDA. And what is the requirement for doing it? What type of testing you have to do? What do you, you know, what do you have to do ahead of time? These are all factors that come up, you know, under basically constitutional law. And, and you know, it's nice to talk about, say, well, we have a great constitution. Our constitution is actually great because it is short. We have one of the shortest constitutions ever. And what that means is it actually allows this dirty word that people don't like to hear. Um, it allows judges to adapt, the Supreme Court to adapt as we go. Right? Let's be honest. If the our forefathers, you know, came forward and they saw a plane, they probably pull out their muskets and start shooting at it. Right? If they saw a TV, no telling what they would do. But the point is, is that we have to adjust because of all the technology that's out there and we can't anticipate everything that's going to occur. Um, I think I've taken up a little bit of time. We're going to, I'm going to take it, send it back because I know there are a lot of questions about it and um, <laughs> the red hand and, uh, and I'll leave it to that. And by the way, thank you wife for inviting me. Okay, well, thank you for this wonderful conversation. What I'd like to do is kind of kick off some with some questions about uh, technology. We did have someone uh, ask a question about how thick is gold leaf, and uh, and Dr. James Madden uh, uh, kindly uh, provided that information. But uh, Theda, could you talk maybe about some of the kind of the scale deal more with the scale of what some of these materials are that we would actually be, you know, that, that we would recognize, that we would understand uh, and have a sense to that we could, that, that might then give us a sense of how, how small is really small. Thank you, Dr. Beck. I would have to say, to be honest, um, and even though I've worked in this area for many years, as I used to tell my students, I was nano before nano became cool because we you know, were working on quantum dots and all these sorts of terms. Um, but even for me, in a sense, it's tough to get your head around how small is small, unless you're you know, studying atoms, unless that's part of your um, you know, normal peer view in, in terms of your work. Um, as I mentioned before, I guess one of the, what, another example is if you took a strand of hair right? I'm not going to do it, it's going to hurt. But if you pull out a strand of hair, and depending on the thickness of your hair, if you slice that uh, down to 75 or 100,000 times, and now again, you're at the point where you can't see it. So to think about, well, how thick is that? It's, it's essentially an invisible thickness. So another thing to note is, you know, we have to use special instrumentation to even verify that things are in the nanoscale and there are certain phenomena that work that way. So I guess I would have to say for anyone really looking at the scale, um, that um, a slide that was up earlier, if you just Google the scale of things um, and it, it's the Department of Energy has put it out and you know, pick your poison. If you're in the biology, if you, um, you know, wanna look at the head of a pin, you can get down there, but it really is, I guess in the most basic sense, 
thinking of atoms or a few atoms coming together. So that's that's the best I can give you out of that. Um, think of atoms. So, yeah. So I was uh, I did see something on that on that scale that I found uh, that, that kind of conjured up a, a, a kind of a silly question, but. Um, uh, uh, I, I've always been fascinated by the architecture of Buckminster Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, for whom the Buckyball is, uh, is is named. And you know, so the, the the question would be: Does the have you built Buckyballs, or have you built nanotubes that are big enough for a Buckyball to go through? And is there would there be kind of a silly but but interesting application for that? Actually, I'd have to say yes. Now, first, in mentioning buckyballs, I must give or uh, pay homage, as they say, to my freshman chemistry teacher, the late Dr. Rick Smalley out of Rice University. And we had no idea back at the time, you know, we were in school, uh, my, myself and fellow students, that he was going to be a Nobel laureate. But he and um, two others shared the Nobel Prize for their discovery of buckyballs. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and could so, you, could you uh, we, we just got a question from someone oh, wanting a little more definition about what a buckyball is. Oh, sure, sure, no problem. Um, carbon um, comes in various forms. So you can take carbon just off of the periodic chart. And whenever you see the letter C right in, in, a, in a strand like of molecules, then you know we're talking about usually something organic. That, that's sort of the definition where it's organic, we include carbon. But Carbon can be in the form of a diamond, right? Carbon, carbon comes in the form of, you know, what's in your pencil lead. Well, what a buckyball turned out to be was 60 carbon atoms, but they arranged themselves in such a configuration that as Professor Smalley explained to us, well, me when I met him years later, um, it was, it's a soccer ball configuration. So it's really carbon atoms, but in a a configuration that had not been studied or understood or even discovered before. As a result of that configuration, it looks like kind of a geodesic dome if you would have cut it in half. And so Buckminster Fuller, the, I believe, British architect who was known for geodesic domes, um, the, the, uh, the term for these fullerenes, which was the more formal term, but the term became buckyballs kind of in reference to Buckminster Fuller and the geodesic dome because that's kind of the shape it was. Have you ever been to Epcot Center and the big, you know, globe type thing in the front, it looks like a soccer ball? That looks like a buckyball. Okay, so, so that being said, if you think of a buckyball as being about a nanometer in diameter, carbon nanotubes can be, when, when the material, um, the graphene is, is, is rolled, if you will, when it's formed, you can have varying diameters. Now, to be perfectly frank, I cannot think of an application right off the bat where say you'd kick a buckyball through a carbon nanotube. But to carbon nanotube, uh, to the credit of a carbon nanotube, first, just in case you know anybody um, doesn't know, right now, this is considered to be the strongest material on earth. Um, people have literally talked about building ladders to the moon. It would be strong enough, but Here's the catch, as I, there's always you know, one step forward, two steps back, right, in science and engineering. So the two steps back is getting enough of the material produced and getting it in long enough strands to do that, which is not quite the case yet. But it's very strong. It's thermally very resistant. It allows electrons to flow through as fast or faster than anything we have in other semiconductors. So its usefulness is, is wide ranging. Actually, in my lab, we've done some work. We typically work with, um, in the last few years, what we call depositions, depositing these materials on surfaces, S semiconductor surfaces, metal surfaces, what have you, to see what type of phenomena might be exhibited on these different surfaces. So we did some work with carbon nanotubes. But to get back to your original question, um, I we didn't do anything particularly with buckyballs or putting them to two through tubes, but I suppose it is a, you know, and, and who's to say? Someone may have just come up with something that we need to check out in the lab. And if I get a Nobel Prize, let me know who you are. <laughs> so the, um, uh, well, I mean, I think that this, it also kind of goes to both 
the, the, the challenge of dealing with, nano, with nanoscale materials is that you have to find ways to capture people's imagination about how to envision what it is. It, it, the metaphor doesn't always match up all the way through. You, you imagine a ball actually bouncing along. These things don't do that sort of thing. And um, uh, so it, that's one of the challenges that you brought up with, um, uh, uh, with that film, that, uh, the, the excerpt from uh, G.I. Joe, um, <laughs> is exactly that sort of thing, that the, the metaphor works, but not in real life. So, um, but it gets, but gets, but, but I do want to get to something in, in real life that, that actually I think a lot of people would be interested in, and that has to do with the, the relationship between nanoscale materials, both uh, from the, an engineering perspective, uh, mechanical engineering perspective, not mechanical, material engineering perspective, as well as from a biological perspective. And this is something that we're actually all looking at right now in terms of the vaccine for, especially for COVID-19. Um, and so Dr. Race, I would really like your thoughts on kind of the challenges that these kinds of mRNA uh, vaccines have in uh, both in from a, how they present themselves, both from a legal perspective, and then we'll turn to Dr. Daniel's race for, uh, uh, for looking at it from a, a more technical uh, uh, perspective. So Dr. Race, your, your thoughts on this? Um, well, first I would say that uh, most people don't know viruses are tend to be strands of RNA uh, or DNA that invade a cell and then get the cell to replicate themselves. And that for the member your freshman biology, to get from the DNA, it will send out messenger RNA across the uh, uh, the uh, nucleus into the cell to then tell proteins what proteins to make and what to do. What we did, is, what I wouldn't say what we did, what they what they did, I should say, uh, they were already working on a SARS vaccine. And so COVID is actually related to SARS. So what they did is they took the SARS vaccine, which was already a messenger RNA vaccine they were working on, and then modified it for COVID, which is why, by the way, we were able to get through it so quickly. Now, and of course, therefore, when we do the vaccine, what we're doing is we're sending in this modified messenger RNA to actually tell the cells, look, we are a virus, respond, create antibodies, create plasmids so that when there actually is the virus, then you already have those plasmids that can fight the uh, COVID when, when you're infected. Now, the problem you have is that when you're getting to nanoscale materials, you know, and they can be smaller than the strand of, than a single strand of DNA. I mean, in terms of the thickness of the DNA, they are they are that small. They they are so small that it's very easy for them to uh, cross into cells to be delivered. And so, when you're getting devices, yeah, the device itself is not uh, is not on a nanoscale level, although it can be extremely extremely small, smaller than we've ever had before. Uh, but it is something that's based upon those properties that are discovered through nanotechnology. And so now we're using that in the human body. Or we're using that in our food processes. And we're using that, you know, in other things that the, that we take in as a person. And the problem is, is that the body, we don't know everything about the body. It's nice to say that we're learning all the time. But, um, you know, I'm a Trekkie, I admit it. If Bones McCoy comes, came back 300 years, and looked at the medicine, we'll say, he'll say that what we're doing is barbaric. He, you know, we wouldn't know. And so, you know, so when we create something new, like these things based upon nanotechnology that can cross the cell and cross the nucleus very easily, then we don't necessarily know everything that can happen. We can have theories, we can test them in people, FDA requires all that, but we really don't know everything that can happen, which is why you have to do monitoring and everything else. Now, COVID, COVID was actually pretty straightforward because it was already a vaccine, right? Now, is this, and, and can I say absolutely, there's not something we will find out later? No, I cannot say that. I do know that in medicine, we do risk versus reward. 
and that the reward is significantly higher than the risk. Um, and that uh, just from the people who have long-term therapy. So from that standpoint, that is an issue. Now where law is going to get involved, law has to get involved in the front end of the approval. You saw the things that they had to go through to get approval. There is a, you know, there are trials and steps that, uh, that go through it with the FDA before things get improved. And notice other countries had their viruses a little before the United States because the requirements for other countries many other countries are not nearly as stringent, and this is true for any new treatment modality, as we require here in the United States. Um, and there are different reasons for that. Uh, you know, some would say it's because it's too many lawyers, but maybe that's it, who knows. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but these are things that, you, that we go through these trials and stuff, and then, by the way, and then even afterwards, the law, because of the law, we are not, they're required to do the follow-up follow up in terms of who, uh, what happens to people, who they're connected with. And um, it, 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 I will say one other thing that occurs. Within different states, they can actually require to know who you are, uh, who you've exposed yourself to. As a matter of fact, there was one state, I think it was in the Midwest, I don't know whether it was Minnesota, the head of their health department, when they went to some people, they refused to tell them, health department had them arrested and could do that. They had that power. So that, you know, and in, in when we talk about the law, how much power do you have to figure out who is where? You know, who's been exposed to what? Uh, this is something that's gone on for years. I would say, for example, uh, if you remember everything you need to know, you can learn from the godfather, Vito Corleone. When he came, uh, when uh, where was actually Vito Andalini? When he came to America, he was put in quarantine because of smallpox. You know, we we have these issues. We used to have, for example, measles parties. You know, most of us are not old enough for that because we most of us are of the age where we had the measles vaccine. But it used to be you. Hey, it was much worse getting measles as an adult than as a, a young child. So what you would do. One person in the neighborhood got it. You send all the kids down to get it. You know, these are the things that we used to do. So um, I would say that in terms of nanotechnology, because though it is so small, because there is so much that can be done, there is tremendous amount of benefit, but we have to keep the monitoring up because things will come up that we hadn't thought about, that we cannot even conceive at this point in time. Um, I'll give one other quick example, and it's not really directed with nanotechnology, but one of the things as we got smaller and smaller was the ability to create new, um, basically, in vitro fertilization. Now, in order to do that, you have to fertilize a number of eggs. Well, who has ownership of those eggs? That, that's an issue. I'll give another one. There's a tremendous amount of data that's being collected. They can track cars now just by the weight of the cars over some over, over some roads. They can track cereal boxes. They can put a thing on a cereal box that they can actually track that cereal box to your home. Where's the law going to step in and say, okay, that's too much information? Because all that data is great for basically companies, not ne necessarily for us. So, uh, Dr. Daniels Ray, so. Uh, if we could kind of ask the same sort of question, but from the more technical perspective of, uh, of, of the engineering of these things. And maybe, I mean, uh, uh, Paul talked a lot about some of the biological things that were going on. Um, and I think that, that was that, that's probably something we're all really concerned about. Um, but I'm sure that there are non-biological uh, applications that people are thinking about and, and so if you could maybe talk about some of those and, and are there challenges that, that we might want to be uh, concerned about um, with regard to, to, uh, uh, to, to those kinds of environments? Thank you. Um, as far as I've seen, I would say, and, and of course, the greatest concern for people is, is it should be is one's health. So the bio -N is probably where you'll see more of the anything from reasonable concern to alarmist type, you know, issues. On the engineering, mechanical, et cetera side, or at least I'll say my, my piece of the, of the world in, in nanoscience and nanotechnology, we're really looking at things like 
can we make the you know electrons move faster? So can can you now get what you have happening in silicon? Can you speed that up? We will look at things like will light be omitted um, emitted from this particular material of whatever type? So can we make solar cells more efficient? And that's been you know, people have been trying to deal with that for years and years, and that even comes into certain business and even uh, political issues, as I understood from a colleague of mine who worked in solar energy. Um, he's, you know, long since retired now, but he worked in it in the 70s or so, and he said, you know, solar cells would be a lot more efficient today. We'd probably have more people using them, but some of our, I'll just say here in Louisiana, right? I've, I've worked for Exxon and other companies, you know, some of the, uh, you know, petroleum companies would buy up that technology and then kind of keep it under wraps, right? So as in terms of what we're looking for, you also have to keep in mind, sometimes there's just like that, there's a competitive aspect too. So people are always looking for the next fastest, the next brightest in terms of illumination, the next strongest in terms of material to use, but you're also competing with existing technology. So right now, you know, the lion's share of anything semiconductor world is silicon. Silicon's great, it's a single element. You don't have to worry about putting more than one thing together. It's a, forms a, it's a crystalline structure. Um, so I, I like to use the example of think of a classroom where all of the rows of, 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 of desks were lined up. And if you were an electron, and I have a student right now, I can hear laughing because I always said that he would say before I said it, if I'm an electron, if you are, happen to be an electron and you had to walk from the front of the class to the back of the class, right, you would want to walk, you know, down the empty aisle. You don't necessarily want to walk across where you're banging into everybody's desk, right? So you want materials that have these pre predictable, regular, ordered array-like structures. And so um, in the nano world, if you will, as we get things smaller and smaller, we do have materials with those sorts of controls, but then we also get into that Schrodinger's cat sort of world, right? The paradox in terms of quantum mechanics. And, and just simply put, the, the weirdness of quantum mechanics is, you know, the idea is you can be here and you can be here, but you didn't go from here to here, right? Your existence is here and here, but how did you get there? Oh, you didn't cross. And isn't it, I don't know if it's, I think it was, you know, was it still the case where well, Einstein went to his grave, not really believing in quantum mechanics because it really is in a sense, imagination. Um, I, I don't know why I seem to be in a, in a, in a mood or thinking of, of movies, but I will say this, my husband and I saw the movie Ant-Man when it came out and they said the word quantum so many times in that movie, we were laughing. And then actually the main characters made, had a line like, how many more times can we say quantum? You know, and so people are looking in the direction of what happens with an atom, but the physics changes, right? So I would say the are there concerns? There are concerns in terms of the competition of the technology. Certainly, there's safety concerns. I mean, you know, gallium arsenide is a material system I worked in for a long time. The gallium is column three of the periodic chart. Arsenic is column five. Most people have heard of arsenic, right? It's a poison, right? But gallium arsenide is a compound. You know, it comes in the solid, unless you're gonna like rub it all over your hands and like stick your fingers in your mouth, you're, you're, you're not gonna die. On the other hand, if you're dealing with it in the gaseous form, arsine is incredibly poisonous. It's a few, you know, I think parts per million, even parts per billion that could wipe out, you know, a section, a block or what have you. So these, so the concerns with nanoscience, nanomaterials, nanotechnology um, is both with, has to do with what, yes, what can happen in the environment. One of the payoffs is um, some materials we worked with some years ago could be used as sensors, sensors of pollutants, for example. Well, that's a good thing, right? But on the other hand, are you putting something out there that would be a pollutant? There's always a balance. So on the technological end, the first thing, at least certainly in my laboratory, that we look at is, is safety, right? We, I'm, I'm not a chemist, as I say, so I, I don't, you know, have my students start mixing things up and not knowing what's going to happen. We, we consult our colleagues appropriately, um, but uh, by the same token, on the technological end, usually we're pretty laser focused on, you know, 
faster, stronger, more efficient. So sometimes it does take our colleagues in other areas and including the health sciences to say, well, wait a minute, right? Can this get in your skin? Will this get in the air? So we do try, when I say we, I mean myself and my students in the field you know, of people working researchers in general do make sure to uh, approach things with caution and just the basic knowledge of the substance of the chemical, you know, gallium arsenide, arsenic, right? It's not something you run into in your typical EE course, but if you come in the lab, you need to know what that is. So I would just so, say that we need the balance. That's it, balance. Okay. So I, um, uh, Aileen um, has a great question about the tools and equipment that you use to create, that are used to create nanotechnologies. And, you know, it's, it's it, I think it's hard for anyone to just grasp the idea of how you would build something without being able to actually see it. Yeah. And so yeah. could, could, could you give us some, some examples of that? Yeah, my wife is going to say something about this, but I need to say one thing first, that I teach my students that every field creates their own language. And uh, she used to do what she said was molecular beam epitaxy. So as a physician, I'm trying to figure this out and epitaxis in you know, medicine means nosebleed and see molecular beams. So I'm going, okay, you're using lasers to stop nosebleeds, right? Uh, which obviously that is completely wrong. So go ahead, tell them about your equipment. <laughs> okay. okay, believe it or not, the equipment to create things in the nanoscale, um, that's not as entirely new as you might think. For example, um, folks working in electrochemistry, have, that's been around for quite some time. And, but by the same token, we can take some um, substance in some sort of solvent, if you will. One of my students has been working on um, zinc oxide nanoparticles. You can even buy the nanoparticle form, dissolve it in a certain type of uh, solvent. And long story short, you get these particles that you don't see, but you can measure a behavior electronically. So for example, if you have you know, some probes in this you know, container, in this liquid, does a current conduct? And does the current conduct, is it, you know, uh, uh, um, is, is, can you make measurements of what's happening? Is it something faster or is it um, a higher in magnitude? And you know that wouldn't happen with just say a standard material. But it's not just phenomena. Um, ever since development of things like the electron microscope, so your typical microscope, right? You look in the eyepiece and you're using, you know, light, optical light to um, look at that particular item and magnification. But there are other types of microscopes out there that actually are not using light. So, for example, um, um, in my laboratory, we have an atomic force microscope. We're, we're working on making, fixing it now because it's kind of old. But anyway. Um, in the atomic force microscope situation, you actually have a probe tip, and these you can buy from companies that make them. Um, they can get to the point where they can etch something down that it, it's like, think of a needle, but at the edge of the needle, it's so small, it's only a few atoms thick. So that needle, I would say, let's do this. Here's my needle. And my hand is, you know, say it's a little piece of metal. I can see that. I can see that in the box. What I can't see is this little needle. I'm kind of trusting that the company said they made it, it's on there. But I can put this cantilever as it's called into an atomic force microscope. And the idea is those materials down at that nanoscale, they're not necessarily perfectly smooth, right? They're little hills and valleys. So as that needle goes across, whether it touches or not, there are different ways to do it, but let's say if that needle and the atoms at the end are interacting with the atoms of that material, so even my skin, right, it's not perfectly smooth. So that needle is going to go up and down and up and down as it interacts atomically, right? Now, that motion up and down, think of a seesaw. Now that cantilever is moving. Well, it turns out that cantilever's motion can be picked up by an actual laser, laser light. And when that laser light hits a detector, the detector says, oh, well, you move this way. So that translates to an electrical signal, which means I get a blip on the screen that looks like this. It, it, it's kind of like the way a phonograph needle 
uh, replicates audio, it's, it's, it's literally an analogous movement from one space to another, from one scale to another scale. Indeed, yes, That's sir. That's fascinating. Yeah, so it's things like that. It's, it's we, we can track, and honestly, it's not even that the atoms are touching. Here in Louisiana, one of the things we deal with is humidity, right? So there actually is a, is a thin layer on just about everything, well, anywhere, anywhere there's you know air, but there's a thin layer of, um, if you wanna say water vapor, vapor and you know dust particles and whatever, but even that thin layer mimics at the atomic level, the structure. And so, as you say, the photograph needle, a uh, phonograph needle rather, can pick up that motion and ultimately, you know, is electrical and converts to an audio signal. So we can get a picture of what something looks like on an atomic surface to see if it's smooth or rough or what have you. And there are different things that uses mechanical motion, but there are other microscopes that maybe, as I call it, fire electrons through the material. And as those electrons interact with the material, they uh, transmit through and the difference in the, let's say refraction, you know, the bending of, of light, as it goes through, you actually can get a measurement or a look at that material. And unfortunately, cause I'm so, I'm talking with my hands and I'm used to having something to show. <laughs> so to just say it by words is, is tougher than if I could give you a picture. But the bottom line of it is, is if we believe physics, I think, and for the most, I think we do, my friends in physics, my peeps, right? <laughs> if we believe physics and we believe the predictions of our colleagues in, theor in the theoretical end of things, as an experimentalist, we look for ways to see and understand maybe some of those predicted phenomena or vice versa. We discover certain phenomena such as, you know, why is light coming out of this material? And then we turn to our colleagues on the theoretical end and say, help us understand why, why that happened. Why did that happen? Yeah. Um, Dr. Madden uh, posted a um, kind of a comment question sort of that MIT and Harvard have been in battle to create, uh, I guess it's a video that's on YouTube about nonstick ketchup bottles <laughs> that are ketchup bottles that are lined with some kind of nanomaterial. So, because I mean, who, who hasn't had the experience of shaking a <laughs> Uh, um, uh, a ketchup bottle and not getting anything to come out. Um, Dr. Race, I was, it, it does bring up kind of, a, 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 it ties in again to this world of the connections between uh, health, biology, um, nanomaterials. Are there, uh, are there, are there things that you have seen that, that, that would uh, cause you real concern in this or, or is the, is the functionality, as, as you said, before, as you said earlier, the, the value of, of, of you know, of, of whether something is, you know, the, the value of, say, the mRNA vaccine, right. the risk versus the reward. Um, um, are there things that I am currently worried about? Um, not necessarily, because I don't know. I, the one thing I am more worried about is, is, is worried as I am biologically, I'm actually more worried from a legal standard with privacy. Uh, I think that the advent of nanotechnology has allowed the accumulation of so much information and we don't even realize that we are giving permission. Every time they ask for a cookie, we are actually giving access to information. Every time that they uh, we sign on for a, a, a some people sign on for a game. You are actually giving access to information. And of course, why would we say yes to that? In fact, in Europe, they were concerned about technology, so they made they were debating a law to require this notification of issues. And the company said it would cost them so much and put them out of business. Well, as it turns out, it didn't cost them anything because they always get permission. Because let's be honest, how many of us actually read that information? I'm a lawyer, I know it's a problem, and I don't take the time to read it. And I know if I say no, then I won't be able to use whatever I'm trying to get anyway. So from a privacy standpoint, I am much more concerned about privacy and the information that gets out about us. Matter of fact, my son gave us, he's a computer scientist, gave us, um, what is it, uh, Alexa? What do you call it? The, uh, uh, um, the Alexa. Echo? The Echo, gave us an Echo. Right. As soon as my wife found out that it can, it will collect data on us, 
uh, it was either going to be thrown away or he was going to take it back, one or the other. So, uh, it's in the closet, in the box. I don't know it's still in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that yeah, I think that you know, in terms of information, we don't even have, and, and we don't even have to give permission for them to collect data on us the way that we have we are in the street. We now know, for example, that they track your phone anywhere. Right. Well, if they can track your phone, they can track anything you buy. They can actually track how much time you spend in a in a restaurant or in a grocery store. They they can track where you drive and. All this data speaks to you, which means that they are tailoring stuff to get you to buy, and they have information out there. From a and, legal and the, standpoint, yeah. I'm trying to figure out why, uh, right. uh, what we need to do in terms to rein that in. And I and that's the real difficult question for the legal community right now. Okay. Well, I have an easy and quick question for both of you as we get to the end of the hour. Um, we talked, uh, 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 Thea, you had uh, given us an example of a, uh, a film that thoroughly misrepresents nanoscale technologies. Um, Dr. Race, you have uh, uh, told us that you are a, a bona fide Trekkie as well, as am I, live long and, live long and prosper. Um, so what is, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the movie that you think is either the worst at representing nanotechnology or the best at representing nanotechnology? Go ahead, I can tell you the worst for me. Go, go, you go first. I'm trying to think of some, what, go on. Keanu Reeves in The Day the Earth Stood Still. Not only was it a <laughs> bad remake, the nanotechnology of it was just absolutely, you know, the idea of it was just nuts. So, horrible movie. Sorry, Keanu. <laughs> <laughs> But he was great in the Matrix. He was great in the Matrix, but that was but a very different. bad move for nanotechnology. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and Dr. Daniel positive, I, I would talk yeah. about the nanobots actually that are used in Star Trek all the time, in the in the uh, next generation, you know, as a potential for the, of what it can do. Sure. Dr. Daniels Race. Oh gosh, I I guess I would just. You asked me about movies and I'm blanking. <laughs> I I would I will say this. Um, um, as you can probably guess, we will watch some of these movies and we have actually like yelled at the television, like you know, no, um, <laughs> as to the science of them. Um, I, I will say this. I, I I'm not sure about a, particularly a nano one right now, but there's a movie where a black hole forms in the state of Texas. Oh yeah, oh geez, oh yeah. And <laughs> it's just in Texas. Uh, my husband's from Texas, so we thought that was pretty funny. And there's another one called, um, I think it's called Absolute Zero that I've talked to my students about where something the earth is tilted at the axis or something and everything starts to freeze and get down to absolute zero. But there's this hilarious scene where this guy's running. Of course, he's the bad guy. He's running through a tunnel and you see ice crystals forming behind him, you know? <laughs> and he's trying to get into the chamber where the sci these two scientists, a man and a woman, you know, are in there and they're supposed to, you know, the last people on earth. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? And they look up through this sort of skylight and there's a helicopter and they're saying, we, we're saved. Well, if it's absolute zero, how are the blades of the helicopter, <laughs> you know? So I think it, it's, <laughs> Usually the ones where they have something nano killing you um, are not so well done. But once in a while they do have little, I think actually Ant-Man had a few little bits in there, but maybe more than a few that, that weren't so bad. I'd have to watch the game. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be quoted on that because I'd have to see it again to remind myself, you know, uh, somebody saying that helium freeze in that movie. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's it, it, it was a lot. It's a lot of these movies, I guess, for the sake of cost, they make in Canada, and and I love Canada. I have dear friends in Canada, but we crack up about you know really a black hole in Texas. Anyway, Saturday um, afternoon Sci-Fi Channel, or Bad or, or um, Amazon Prime. I, I don't work for them. I'm not advertising, but they have some of the best of the worst Sci-Fi movies, and I'm sure there's something on there with a nano something or another. Um, you have to uh, you not got to dig deeply. You got to go to the movie and then click other people watched and keep going down about three rungs. And it's really bad. 
<laughs> so so kind of at to, to the at a level or the or uh, yeah. never mind that's just a bad <laughs> joke okay yeah, well, mind thank, you, <laughs> thank you both for what a for an absolutely delightful and engaging discussion um this has been really terrific and we really appreciate your time uh tonight's lucky winner of the wrkf drawing is samantha beekman WRKF will mail you the Science Friday beverage tumbler uh, shortly, and I hope you enjoy it. We look forward to seeing you again next month on Tuesday, April 27th, for a Science Cafe talk on how recent technological innovations may reshape how we understand and treat serious mental illness with Dr. Alex Cohn. Thank you all so much for attending. We look forward to seeing you then. Good night. <laughs>